Okie dokie, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the scientific method and measurement skills that you need for earth science. Scientific method is the step someone takes to identify a question, develop a hypothesis, design and carry out steps or procedures to test the hypothesis, and document observations and findings to share with someone else. In other words, it's a way to solve a problem. The scientific method attempts to minimize the influence of the scientist's bias on the outcome of an experiment. That is, when testing a hypothesis or a theory, the scientist may have a preference for one outcome or another. And it is important that this preference not bias the results of their interpretation. The most fundamental error is to make the hypothesis for an explanation of a phenomenon without performing experimental tests. Sometimes common sense and logic tempt us into believing that no test is needed. There are numerous examples of this dating from the Greek philosophers to the present day. Another common mistake is to ignore or rule out data which do not support the hypothesis. Ideally, the experimenter is open to the possibility that the hypothesis is correct or incorrect. Sometimes, however, a scientist may have a strong belief that the hypothesis is true or false or feels internal or external pressure to get a specific result. In that case, there may be a psychological tendency to find something wrong, such as systematic effects with data which do not support the scientist's expectations, while data which do agree with those expectations may not be checked as carefully. The lesson is that all data must be handled in the same way. Francis Bacon once said, I have taken all knowledge to be my province, um, and it was a letter to Lord Burley in 1592. Bacon's ambition was not nearly to master all knowledge, but to reform it especially the way in which new knowledge was to be acquired. The method was to be inductive and experimental, amassing data on important subjects, classifying them, and developing them from wider rules and hypotheses. Like Paracelsus, Bacon rejected the old Aristotelian learning still taught in the universities and proposed a new method, a new logic, in his Novum Organum. Bacon was not himself a distinguished scientist, though he dabbled in experiments. His importance is in the way he articulated what was to become the dominant mode of thought. Bacon's contributions to the scientific method was not to invest it, and sorry, to invent it, but to organize it in a standardized format that uses formal logic and reasoning to assess the ways in which the world works. So let's talk about the scientific method specifically. In other words, how does it start? It is observation more than anything that is where the scientific method truly begins. One cannot even approach a problem without being able to observe the world and finding that the problem or phenomenon exists in the first place. The next step of the scientific method is to break down the observation into many smaller parts. Once that's done, it's time to develop a problem or question to explore and do lots of research. A hypothesis is a tentative statement that proposes a possible explanation to some phenomenon or event. A useful hypothesis is a testable statement, which may include a prediction. A hypothesis should not be confused with a theory. Theories are general explanations based on large amounts of data. The key word here is testable. That is, you will perform a test of how two variables might be related. When you are doing a real experiment, you are testing variables. Usually a hypothesis is based on some previous observations, such as noticing that in November many trees undergo color changes in their leaves, and the average daily temperatures are dropping. Are these two events connected, and if so, how? Any laboratory procedure you follow without a hypothesis is not really an experiment. It's just an exercise or a demonstration of what is already known. Formalized hypotheses, for, exam for example, if skin cancer is related to ultraviolet light, then people with a high exposure to UV light will have a higher frequency of skin cancer. So in other words, formalized hypotheses are in if-then format. So back to our example with the leaves, if leaf color change is related to temperature, then exposing plants to low temperature will result in changes in leaf color. Notice that these statements contain the words if and then. They are necessary in a formalized hypothesis, but not in, 
all if-then statements are hypotheses. For example, if I play the lottery, then I will get rich is a simple prediction. In a formalized hypothesis, a tentative relationship is stated. For example, if the frequency of winning is related to the frequency of buying lottery tickets, then is followed by a prediction of what will happen if you increase or decrease the frequency of buying the lottery tickets. If you always ask yourself that if one thing is related to another, then you should be able to test it. So I'd like you to rephrase the following general hypotheses into formalized hypothesis. I, I want, I'm going to give these to you, and if you want to check them out with me by email, feel free, or come to office hours and we'll go over it. So the first one is chocolate may cause pimples. Rephrase that into an if-then statement. The second one is salt in soil may affect plant growth. The third one, plant growth may be affected by the color of the light. Fourth, bacterial growth may be affected by temperature. Again, you're rephrasing these in formalized hypothesis format, which is an if-then statement. Fifth, ultraviolet light may cause skin cancer. And finally, temperature may cause leaves to change color. So give those a couple a try, and if you want to check your answers with me, feel free to do so. Then the scientist performs the experiment to see if the predicted results are obtained. If the expected results are obtained, the, that supports but does not prove the hypothesis. Keep in mind, you can never, ever, 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 ever prove a hypothesis. You can only support or not support it. In science, when testing um, and doing the experiment, it must be a controlled experiment. The scientist must contrast an experimental group with a control group. The two groups are treated exactly alike except for the one variable being tested. Sometimes several experimental groups may be used. For example, in an experiment to test the effects of day length on plant flowering, one could compare normal, natural day length, the control group, to several variations, which would be the experimental groups. The independent variable is the variable in which you change. Okay, it's the I changed it variable. So if I'm changing the stoppers in the two uh, containers, the stopper is the independent variable. The dependent variable is whether you have maggot growth on the meat. So that is what you're testing for, or what you're checking, or what you're measuring. And the constants are everything else you keep the same um, so that you can compare the two groups. When doing an experiment, replication is important. Everything should be tried several times on several subjects. For example, in the experiment just mentioned, a student scientist would have at least three plants in the control group and each of the experimental groups, while a real researcher would probably have several dozen or hundreds. If a scientist had only one plant in each group and one of the plants died, there probably would be no way of determining if the cause of death was related to the experiment being conducted or if you just had a wonky plant. The experiment will, will gather actual quantitative data from the subjects. For example, it's not enough to say, I'm going to see how the dog reacts in this situation. Rather, in that experiment, the scientist might have a list of certain behaviors and record how often each of the dogs tested exhibits each of the predefined behavior patterns. A conclusion is always based on the actual data and not what you wanted or expected. Conclusions basically evaluate whether or not your hypothesis was supported or not. Okay, so here's where theory and law comes in because it gets a little hairy with people. A theory is a hypothesis that has been supported for more than 50 years in multiple uh, methods, multiple research areas. It's been supported. It's not yet been disproven because the first time you disprove a hypothesis, it's out the window and you got to start over. Okay, so if I dropped a ball under normal conditions and it fell up, we got to throw out gravity. So a theory is a long-tested explanation or hypothesis that's consistently been supported. A law is one that has been doing that for over 200 years, and we're nearly, um, 
we're, we have very few natural laws, but a lot of the laws of motion, for example, are considered laws. Um, so I just want to make sure that you understand that a theory is not what people often think of as a theory. A theory, when people think of it, is a guess. They also think of a hypothesis as a guess, but it's not. And the theory has been tested over and over and over again and still not been disproven. Okay, let's talk about measurement skills in earth science because it's time to switch gears. Okay, so the first one is length measurements. Length measurements is measurements in which uh, you, you measure the linear aspect of some object or another. Length measurements are done in the base form of meters, and in this case we're looking at seeds, and they are two millimeters long. Okay, I want you to see where it says centimeters. Centimeters refer to the big numbers, but there are 10 millimeters in each one. That's how I know that this is two millimeters long. Volumetric measurements are done in base units of liters. And if you take a look, you measure volume in graduated cylinders by looking at the meniscus. Make sure that you're always looking at the bottom of the curve of the liquid, because otherwise your measurements will be wrong. So go ahead and practice that right now. What is the volume on this graduated cylinder? Well, if you looked at the top of the meniscus, it'd be 36 milliliters. But in, in true case, you look at the bottom of the meniscus, and that's at 35. So the volume is 35 milliliters here. Mesh measurements are often done on digital scales nowadays, but you may also run across triple beam balances. Triple beam balances help you to measure mass. And if you take a look at mass measurements, you'll see that the base unit is in grams. So if you take a look at this mass, I want you to measure what, what the mass is here. So take a second, take a look at the picture, pause it, and then come back when you're ready. So the mass measurement on this triple beam balance is registering at 373.4 grams. Density is calculated as mass over volume. Density is an important uh, characteristic of certain minerals and rocks, and so it will become pop it will become important. And you always express density in grams per liter or grams per milliliter. You never do it as a fraction, uh, you never do it as a, des a, a fraction, you always do it as a decimal point. So here's a practice for density. This piece of pumice, which is a type of rock, weighs 125 grams but has a volume of 500 milliliters. What is the density of this sample? Well, remember density is mass over volume, so you take the 125 grams and you divide it by 500 milliliters. And you get a density of 0.25 grams per milliliter. Okay, so the next thing I want you to do is practice. Practice, practice, practice. Go through this section in your textbook, go through the quizzes, go through any practice sheets that you have, and make sure that you've practiced with this material, because measurement skills is something that is vital in order to be successful in earth science. So good luck and Godspeed.